So welcome, good to see you all. <laughs> um, so the normals, we're going to worship, um, led by somebody. Um, we're going to hear the Soho give us the word. And um, in the midst of that, we're also going to send um, our little ones out into Bible study. Um, but before we do any of that, I'm going to ask Chanel to come and pray for us. Good morning, church. Let's bow our hearts, our heads. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. Thank you that as little as we are, we are still gathered today um, to listen to what you have to say to us through the Sefer. Um, we pray that our hearts will be open to listen to you, listen to your word, and we also pray that, uh, Holy Spirit, you'll help us understand the meaning of the word today, Lord Jesus, and help, it, help us to apply it in our everyday lives, Lord. We pray that your peace will be with us this morning, that your love will be amongst us, Lord, and as little as we are, we are huge fans of what you have in store for us, Lord. So thank you for this day. Thank you for this morning, and let your word be in our hearts. Amen.
repeat the last few weeks, like I'll have it on loop for five, six, seven times. Um, so thank you for playing that beautiful song. Um, you all know this, but to remind you, to set it in your hearts, in your minds, if somebody asks you what's Fellowship City about, you can sort of tell them from memory because you've heard Zita say several times on the stage. <laughs> um, so three things. The Fellowship City is about three things. We are gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural. When we say we are gospel-centered, we mean we focus on a life-centered and saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming Him as Lord and Savior. We are disciple-making in that as the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that in the lives of others, and we believe that this happens best in the making of disciples. We are transcultural and we adopt the view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context and by the power of the gospel transcends it and creates one new community in Christ. Um, we are a new church plant and we would love to chat and share information. Um, so if you have any questions, please ask. Um, our website is up, up there, fellowshipcity.ca. We have QR codes around at the back in the front. Um, just scan the QR code, it takes you to the website. Um, and on the website there's a contact box where you can fill in if you want content information from, uh, from us. We are on the social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and old school emails as well. If you want information you can send an email and we'll respond promptly. Um, we can send the kids out, let's go. Yes, so just behind there's a door there that takes us into the room where the children are going to be so that the children can go out and once the children are out and all settled down, the circle is going to come up and uh, continue with their last. Good morning. There we go. We have some. I've got three announcements for us this morning before we get into the work. The first one is that there is not going to be carols anymore. We had spoken about a carol service that was going to happen next week on the 10th, uh, but due to the rising um, new cases of, of people with COVID, we decided that it's not the right time to have carols. So we were going to have carols on Friday the 10th at 6 o'clock, so please don't come. There won't be anyone here. We won't have carols at this week. Um, we are sorry, we were looking forward to it, like Zita had mentioned once or twice, uh, but we had to make that tough decision that it is in the best interest of, of everyone to not have carols. We also not going to have question of the day today. I know the extroverts are going to be upset at this, but there's no question of the day today. The introverts are going to be a bit happy. Um, again, the reason is in relation to the rising um, infection rates of COVID. That we don't want to be held up in small spaces where someone might take off their mask and, and sort of uh, not be in a safe space. The reason why we still have coffee is because we've got sanitizing stations around that and not, not all contact will ultimately lead to someone maybe catching COVID. So we have coffee, there will be coffee and tea afterwards, there won't be question of the day, just as we try to navigate this, this season or this time. Um, Sunday services. This is going to be the last physical Sunday service. We are going to move to Zoom again from next week, but there will be two services only from next week. Um, so the reason again is the same reason. We were looking forward to having two more physical services, but because of the rising number of COVID cases, we're not going to meet physically from next week. So there will be comms that go out on Tuesday to the same effect that don't register, they won't be a registration link, don't ask for one, it's not going to be there. There will be a Zoom link so that you can join Zoom next week and the week after. So two more services until the end of the, the, the season for us, or the end of the year for us. Um, so those are the three um, really important announcements that will be communicated afterwards. I do want you to know that uh, due to ESCOM, there will be load shipping, um, but we will keep going. So it will happen at some point. 
Um, not immediately. We've got some grace. They've given us some grace, maybe 10, 15 minutes. When that happens, we will still continue. Um, but I'm going to ask Bethany to come and read the teaching text for us this morning, and then I'll be back up. Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Yes, you can. Awesome. Um, we're going to be reading from Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 8 to 20. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly host, with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about the child, and all who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So as I mentioned, um, we will have Lord Shady. When that happens, we will keep going. Uh, Lord Shady will not stop us from, from fellowshipping together. Um, I do want to, at that point, thank all the people who serve to put together a Sunday service. Um, as this is our last one, this year, as we move on to digital services, it's it's wonderful to know that we've got so many people who want to put their hands up to to serve and to to help. When we move over into digital services, that will remain the same because those people will still be serving. Those details will be up on the website. Those details will be sent on to the WhatsApp groups about the digital service that's going to start from next week. So I do want to thank all the people that serve to make together a Sunday, that put together a Sunday. And I want to ask if Shiami, if the lights do go off, if you can just open the, the curtains and the slide, the sliding door, just add some extra light, then we can continue with our service. I am holding a towel here. Um, I don't want to alarm you. Um, the towel, whenever I see a towel, I'm worried that the person with the towel is signifying that they're going to be speaking for long, <laughs> that they're going to be up here for long, hugging the mic for dear life. Uh, this towel is just for me. Um, I do sweat a bit. Um, I want to say that the Word of God is hot. I'll say that. <laughs> the Word of God is hot. Um, maybe why, uh, why I sweat. Um, so if you ever see me with a towel on setting up, you, you know the towel is just for me to keep um, looking neat, looking tidy, to not sweat too much. So the towel is here. Don't be alarmed. We will be out here soon. <laughs> And my name is Lesejo. If you have not met me before, I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ in Fellowship City as one of the elders. We have been sent out as a plurality of elders. What that means is two elders being sent out to plant a church, myself and Reino Meya, who you may have met. This morning I have the joy of sharing God's word with you, opening up God's word with you. Um, and it is a joy for me. I am not so sure about your ears. Um, but it is certainly a joy for you. Mm-hmm. 
we believe in a balanced diet as Fellowship City. What that simply means is we look through the scriptures from Old to New Testament. Sometimes we look at themes, sometimes we look at books, sometimes we look at topics, sometimes we look at line by line exposition, or sometimes generally through the text. That's why in this season, going through the season of Advent, which is an important season for us as a church, we have been looking at specific themes. Hope was the first theme that Raymond you know, shared from last week, and today's theme is peace. So we're going to see what the scriptures have to say about peace. Um, even though I mentioned the balanced diet, I know that some people would have moved to me speaking about food. I do want to assure you that there will be no food today in the service to those that are looking forward to something to eat. I won't be posting any pictures and I will not like on Rudolph to keep me true to that. So there will be no pictures of food. But we do believe in a balanced diet, which is why we go through the whole Bible in certain seasons, in certain ways. So we started the season of Advent. We looked at hope last week. If you missed that sermon, please feel free to go onto YouTube or on, on, on any audio podcasting platform. You'll find the sermon there and you can enjoy it there. As I mentioned this week, we look at peace. Uh, peace as a theme and we will be spending most of our time in Luke chapter 2, which is definitely read for us. We will be looking at other scriptures as well that support this text but we'll be spending most of our time in Luke chapter 2. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 2 through some lenses. The lenses are um, fear and the antidote of fear, peace and peacemakers. So fear and the antidote of fear, peace and peacemakers. So those are the themes that you'll see as we grapple with Luke chapter 2. So verse 1 to 8 paints a picture of a time when a decree was made by Caesar Augustus. So Caesar makes this decree. It's an official order that everyone should move and be registered. So think of a census. So Caesar is saying everyone needs to be censored. They need to move to where they can be registered. And this results in this decree having Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem at a time and season that God would have them in Bethlehem. So Mary and Joseph are in, are in, in Bethlehem. Mary is pregnant. And it comes time for them to give birth. While they lay, I mean, you, you can also think of a scripture, Micah chapter 5 verse 2 speaks about the same setting, the same scene. But you, Bethlehem, th though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. That's what Micah says. That's why we see this picture of God moving Mary and Joseph into Bethlehem. That's why we're seeing them looking for a place to have this baby. They didn't find the place of Michelangelo or the Protea Hotel Fire and Ice. They found it in an inn where there was a, an, inn, an inn and in that inn there was a manger. That's where the baby lay. A manger, you can think of a manger as like a wooden box that, that horses would feed from. Think of that like a troll. So that's where the baby Jesus was born into. So that's when we jump into verse 8. So that's what's happened in verse 1 to 8. Decree was made, Mary and Joseph moved to Bethlehem. They are due to have a baby. Baby comes, they're in, a, they're in an inn, and in the manger, the baby comes. Verse 8 reads as follows In the same reason, in the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over the flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. So verse 11 is likely the most used or spoken verse in relation to Christmas. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Probably the, the most commonly used verse in this Christmas period. These were words spoken by the angels to the shepherds who were out of the field. So Luke tells us that the shepherds were afraid. They were terrified. And in the King James translation, it says they were so afraid. In the Greek, the word for afraid is phobon or phobia. 
and so afraid is closer to megaphobia. So they were so afraid, so megaphobia. That's how afraid they were to encounter these angels. But these angels tell them to not be afraid. But they're saying, don't be afraid if you look at what we are about to say to you, what we are about to share with you. So they bring news or they are about to share something with the shepherds. And they have a cure for their fear. They have an antidote for this fear that they have. I think it's important to know why they were afraid. We see or we will see a pattern throughout the Bible when God shows up and people are afraid. We see this in the Garden of Eden after the fall. So in Genesis 1 and 2, we see there isn't any fear. It's a perfect, perfect relationship with God that Adam and Eve had. They don't live within that fear. But sin then enters the world. The fall happens. And then we start to see fear. They were afraid when God appeared in his glory. We see the same thing here. The same kind of fear. The glory of the Lord shone around them. That's what verse 9 says. The glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were afraid. So think about it. If we're completely filled with the love of God, then we won't fear. That was Adam and Eve before sin entered the world. Completely filled with the love of God and they were in no fear. But after sin entered the world, that's when fear came in. We generally are afraid of rejection. Or maybe let me say I. We, I or myself would be afraid of rejection. Some people may be afraid of what people think of them. We may be afraid of bad things happening. We may be afraid of the next five years or two years even. We may be afraid of death or maybe may be afraid of sickness. If we had a perfect relationship with God, we would not be afraid of rejection, afraid of what people think, afraid of the future or even afraid of death because God conquered death. We know that God is sovereign. He is in control and we trust Him. Fears from the fall. Fears from when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3. Sin entered the world through the devil placing doubt and suggestions on Adam and Eve to be king of their own lives. To not let anyone tell them what to do. To be in control of their own lives. And if they aren't in control, then you're not going to find happiness. So sounds familiar, isn't it? That may be true of some of us who are sitting here. Afraid of the future. Wanting to be in control of our own lives. We have a desire to be in control, a desire to be king of our own lives. So just think of what this fear also brings. Fear of failure. Because we want to earn affirmation and earn approval from others. Sometimes even approval from God. Fear of the future. Fear of death, sickness. Losing everything and everyone. We see verse 9 speaks about the glory of the Lord shining there, shining everywhere. When God reveals himself, people are fearful. We see Adam and Eve. Why is it that every time we get closer to God or he draws nearer to us that we're afraid? Some of you may know a series called Suits. It is a law series which has held many viewers captive, captivated the storylines and the plot twists. In this series, we have Michael Ross, who is an uh, aspiring attorney, or someone who retains information like no one has seen. So he retains information really well. He wants to make money, so he goes on and writes the bar exam, the law bar exam for other people. And then he meets um, Harvey Specter, who is another famous lawyer. And as he meets him, Harvey Specter is looking for an assistant. Then Ross, because he's in trouble, moves into that room and starts pitching for this assistant position. But Harvey Specter knows that he's not from, the, from, from any esteemed or known law college or law school. But because of his retention of knowledge, he's able to show himself to, to really know the subject matter at hand, which is law. 
So Harvey hires him. But over a time, over a period of time, you start to see that Ross is afraid of different people in different times. He's afraid of the district attorney because he may be found out. He's afraid of some of the other lawyers in the firm, if you think about Jessica and Lewis. He's afraid of these other people that might be able to see that he is not who he says he is. So he's afraid of being found out. This is the same as someone who is proud of being smart and moves into a room with other smart people. Afraid of being found out. Afraid of being found to impersonate someone who's smart. We, because of sin, want to take on a job to be our own masters, to be king over our own lives. So when God comes into our presence, we may be fearful because he poses, he, his power shows our weakness. His glory shows our darkness. So we may be afraid because we are taking the job of God. We are wanting to be king and in control of our own lives. And when he comes, his power shows our weakness and his glory shows our darkness. We may be afraid also because we know that we live against his direction. We live in sin. So the angels come to the shepherds and say, don't be afraid, this is verse 10. Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that, they will, that, that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Fear not, and this is why. This is the antidote. This is why you shouldn't fear. I have good news. These news bring great joy. A Savior who was promised is born, the Messiah. If you don't want to be a slave to fear, rest in the salvation that he brings. This salvation is through the forgiveness of sins. If you ever sinned against God, then you need a savior. If you ever wanted to be king over your own life, then you need a savior. If you ever lied, angry at your brother, or looked at someone last week, then you need a savior. That's what the Ten Commandments show us. They show us the need, our ultimate need for a savior. Only God can forgive sins. We see this in Matthew 1, verse 21. We shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Only God can forgive sins. This forgiveness of sins is the salvation that we need to rest on. That he forgives our sins. So if you want to be free, then rest in the salvation that Jesus brings for you. I know some may hear this and still ask, how can I trust him? How can I let him be in control? This reminds me of a conversation that I had in the car with my wife in the last few few days. This was about probably what we've seen as the most difficult year for us in our lives. That there has been long-term illness, clear implications of relationships that were broken or hurt, close relationships, real financial implications to deal with. Illness, disaster after disaster, a few operations here and there, accident here and there, a few changes that impact on us as a family. That's been our year. I can say a few times we were shattered, we were down for the count, and we were ready to tap out. We wanted to be in control, we didn't trust God in some of his decisions. However, having this conversation in the car showed us how fortunate we are that God is in control that we have God, that He is sovereign, that we were loved by many, many in this very community. We're sitting here listening on in your digital platforms. We were loved remarkably. We learned to lean into community maybe in a way that we wouldn't have before. We learned to trust God more. And that it doesn't matter what was happening, that His grace was sufficient for us. His grace was sufficient for us. And sometimes it's easier to put your hand around someone else's shoulder and say, His grace is sufficient for you. But maybe not so easy to put it around your own shoulder. Much like trying to bite or lick your elbow. I did try, and I can't do that. I can't get to that. We reminded that He is God. We reminded that He is faithful. What we see in the second part of verse 11, is that He is Lord. That is how we know all of what I've just mentioned. He is Lord. That is why we can trust Him. 
That's why we can say, have your way, Lord. He is Lord. The word used here in the Greek is Kyrios. So every time in the Bible where the name of God, Yahweh is used, or the name of God as the covenant God, the covenant creator, as the transcendent one, every time that Greek word is used, um, it's Kyrios in the Bible, which simply means that he is Lord. It's to show that he is not only born, but that he is God, and that's why we have his Lord here. Otherwise, it could have just been that he is the Messiah, that he was born. But there's a reason why it ends off his, with his Lord. It's that he's not only born, but that's not where the good news ends. The good news ends with the fact that he is Lord, that he is sovereign, that he is God, that he is the creator, that he is Yahweh, and that we can trust him. He came as man to save you and me. He conquers the death that we fear. He heals the sickness that we fear. He gives us an identity so we don't need to be afraid or seek the approval of others. We don't need to be worried about the future because He is God. He alone saves and forgives sins. Verse 12. Verse 12 reads like this. This will be the sign for you. You will find the baby left tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. There are two big ideas that we will see here in this verse. The first is the coming of this child is the greatest revelation of God's glory. We see that in how the angel described it. So the coming of this child is the greatest revelation of God's glory. The baby in the manger has a multitude of angels praising God. Second thing we see is that peace is to spread everywhere the child is or the child is received. So peace is to be spread everywhere. So what is peace? The dictionary, the dictionary describes it as tranquility or freedom from disturbance. A period where there is no war. So there's absolute freedom. So remember this as we speak about peace. So the coming of Jesus brings about glory from man to God. And the coming of Jesus brings peace from God to man. The coming of Jesus brings about glory from man to God. And the coming of Jesus brings peace from God to man. The last part of verse 14 is quite specific. The angels here are not saying peace on earth to everyone. I know that the old King James Version is closer to peace on earth to everyone, but the closer interpretation is that this peace goes out to everyone, but rather this peace is only experienced by those who are his. So the people who receive Christ as Lord and Savior, who trust Him, are the ones that receive this peace, that experience this peace. And how do we know this? We use scripture to interpret scripture. So Luke 10, verse 5 to 6, whatever house you enter, first say peace to this household. If a person of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. We see this also in Luke chapter 2, verse 10. Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. So this good news that brings great joy about a baby in a manger, that brings glory to God and peace to the world is for everyone. But it's experienced by the people who have accepted Jesus. So everyone's got this, this peace, has got this offer of peace. But the ones who trust in Jesus and accept Him as Lord and Savior experience this peace. How do we get this great peace? We get it by hearing the word of God. We hear it. We get it by hearing about Jesus, who came as a baby from Mary, verse chapter 1, and is Lord and brings glory to God. Then by this truth of Him being Savior and Lord, His words change us from the inside out. His words make us more and more like Him, like Jesus Christ. We hear the word being preached or taught or spoken to us. We hear this from normal people. We see it in verse 8 here, we see the shepherds who heard from the angels. So the shepherds are the ones who heard from the angels, but the shepherds then take this word to everyone else. They hurried off and found both, this is verse 16, 
They had it off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was, in, who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. So the shepherds heard from the angels, but everyone else heard from the shepherds. And now in this day and in this age, we hear from the Bible or we hear from other people who share God's word. But see the example of Mary that's being used here. So Mary's been used as an example. In chapter 1, Mary hears about what's to happen for the angels. So she too heard from the angels, like the shepherds. But in verse 19, oh, and she also then hears from the shepherds. She doesn't take the high road that she had already heard from the angels. She listens, she continues to hear from the shepherds. And more importantly, she treasures what she has heard and she meditates on it. In the ESV it says she ponders on it. So the Greek word used here for ponder is more of a cognitive word. So cognitive meaning something that has conscious intellectual activity. So she meditates on it. She's constantly, it, it, constantly it's in her mind. It's, it, it, it's growing. It's, it's, she's letting it, she's fanning the flame of this word. So this word is to put into context, that's what this word means. It means to connect and to understand how the word applies to life. That's what this Greek word means. To connect the word and ask, what does it mean for me? So Mary treasures it, she savors it, she keeps it in her heart. She puts it in her heart and she meditates on it, she ponders it, she grapples with it, she fans the flame of this word. Her reality is changed by what she hears. It is possible to hear the word of God, but also not to hear it. If we remember the parable of the sowers, Jesus speaks about the seed as the word of God, and the seed doesn't germinate in all the different types of soil, but in some soil it germinates. So it's easy to hear the word and to not hear the word. But here we're getting an example from Mary how to hear the word and hear the word. So I didn't mention my wife, I am married to one lady. Uh, I am married to one wife. I think it's always important to mention that. Um, if anyone here were to ask her, she would likely say that I always listen, I don't always hear. And I may say I may hear her, um, but not always really understand the implications. I remember early on in our marriage, and I should say early on, that's not like this often now. Um, she would speak to me sometimes while I was watching sports and she might even be frustrated and ask if I heard her. Then I would go and repeat everything she said verbatim. Sometimes she would take it as I heard her. But I know that I would be surprised if I understood the implications. I could repeat it because I just heard it. But I don't actually know the implications of it. Sometimes I think she does the same. Then she hears me but maybe doesn't understand the implications of what it means for them. So we hear, so we, so here we see that some people are amazed about what they heard, but Mary, Mary treasured it. She meditated on meditated on it. So she heard and heard it. Mary was transformed and understood the implications of what she heard. So just a short side note. So Romans 5 to 8 speaks about our standing with God before we are Christians. We are at war with God before we are Christians. So someone might say, I'm not fighting with God, or I'm not angry with God. But if you're not a believer, then you're at war with God. You're wanting to be king over your own life. You are taking the place of God. You are saying you know better than your maker. So when we see that we need Jesus, that we are slaves to sin, that we can't save ourselves and only Jesus can save us, then we make peace with God. Because we're putting Him in His rightful place. Grace and peace go together. This peace is peace in three different relationships as well, which we see. Three different relationships. So peace with God, 
peace with yourself, and peace with others. So God is a God of peace. So Ephesians 2 verse 14, Jesus himself is our peace, and his peace gives to us. His peace he gives to us. This is what John 14 says. So the peace of God can never be separated from God himself. If we want peace, then we need to have Jesus rule over our lives. Glory to God and peace to you. God getting glory and us getting peace is through believing the promises of God obtained in Jesus. It's through meditating on his promises, understanding the implications for us, and pondering on them like Mary. Romans 15 verse 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. We need this peace with God first. Therefore, this is what Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are seen as just by God. We take on the righteousness of God through faith in God. We then are at peace with God because of Jesus. Not because of anything we have done. He forgives our sins. Only He can forgive sins. God adopts us into his family. We then don't have to act or perform. We have a new identity. We don't have to be in fear. That's peace with God. Peace with ourselves. Because we have peace with God, we can grow in peace with ourselves. Philippians 4 verse 6 to 7 tells us how. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition. Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. At times we may be anxious. We may have doubt. We may be, we may be in guilt. We may have fear. But we are not slaves to the fear. We need to remind ourselves about the promises of God. We need to fan to flame what we have treasured. Like Mary. We need to meditate and ponder on His word. We need to be reminded of His promises and learn how these promises apply to us. Apply to our situation. Facing guilt, facing fear, anxiety is a regular thing. Our hearts and minds are under assault. But also, the meditation and pondering should be regular to help remind us of the promises of God. We should bring these fears and anxiety before him. We should lay them before him. That's what he says. If we do that, the latter part of Philippians says, his peace will guard our hearts and mind. Mm-hmm. That is how we get peace with ourselves. Peace with others. Romans 12 verse 18 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. So this is hard. You can see it as far as it's possible. But God wants us to have peace with others. The key here is to remember the promises of God. If we meditate and ponder on the word of God that we treasure, we will be reminded of how he forgives us. We should be amazed that he loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us. To die for sinners who are at war with him. His forgiveness and promises will help us live peaceably with God. It will help us to forgive one another. Peace with God Peace with ourselves and peace with others brings glory to God and peace to men. Peace with God, peace with ourselves and peace with others brings glory to God and peace to men. Do you see this beautiful cycle? The key is to remember the promises of God by treasuring the word of God and meditating on it and pondering on it and seeing how this word applies to us. So grace and peace go together as we close. We'll see. Grace and peace goes together. We should be the peacemakers of the world. We need to be in every part of society making much of God, giving God the glory. We need to hear like we see Mary does. We need to treasure and meditate on this world. We need to have and live with peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with God. To make much of God and bring Him glory. We need to carry on the work as we see the shepherds have. They were sharing this great news that brings joy about a baby born in a manger. 
who comes to save the world, to bring peace and to save souls. Let us be reminded in, in the season that we could do nothing to save ourselves. God saved Jesus as a baby. Not born in the Hilton, but in a manger so that he could speak to the lowest of people, that he could save everyone. He brings great news. News that brings joy and peace. News that he is the Messiah. He is Lord. He comes to save you and me. You may be sitting here this morning and you may not know Jesus as a man who was born of men. You may not know him as Messiah and Lord, who is sovereign, who is creator and transcendent. And he may be tugging at your heartstrings. He wants to know you and wants to have a relationship with you. He loves you and wants you to have peace. Peace in lasting. Peace in who you are as his child. If this is you and you want someone to pray with, then I encourage you to come after the service up front to pray with someone. Sinawa and Lindy will be up front, I will be also. If you're listening on the website or listening on any of the, the audio podcasting platforms, if you want someone to pray with, please send an email to Community at Fellowship City. And there will be people that are eager to pray with you. And you may know Jesus sitting here as Lord and Savior. He may be the great news that you know that brings you joy. He loves you. He doesn't want you to live in fear, fear of being found out, fear of death, fear of sickness, fear of the future. He wants you to trust him. He is Lord. He wants you to surrender. Let him take his place in your life. Bring all your prayers and petitions to him. Bring your fear and anxiety. He will cover you with peace. Peace everlasting that will cover and hide your heart and mind and heart. Rest on the salvation of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are Lord, you are God. Jesus Christ came, was born. He is Lord, He is Messiah, and He came to save us. He came to forgive our sins. He came to make right the perfect relationship we ought to have. We pray that in this season that we would be reminded of that. That only, not only was He born, but that He is Lord. That we can trust Him. That He is in control. Help us to let him take his place in our lives. That is where we will find great peace. Help us to have peace with God, peace with ourselves, and peace with others. Help us to give God glory and ultimately peace to men. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
We end off every gathering with a benediction, um, meaning a good word. Um, this morning, our benediction is from Philippians 4, verse 6 or 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll have a good, good afternoon further. And just as a reminder, there is no service next week. And there will be no carols on Friday. We will see each other on Zoom next week. The details will be on the website, or you can send an email to Community Fellowship Center if you want to know more. Thank you.